Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to part four of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way. We're getting into some valuable insights from this week's guests that you can definitely apply to your own journey. Please definitely stay tuned for advice and inspiration that can help us all. If you missed the first part of the week in part one, two, and three, definitely go back. The show notes should be filled with all the links, so go and click on them if you need to catch up. Also, definitely subscribe to the channel and all the other ones if you can. It's going to really help the show. But for now, enjoy the rest of the story. I need help. Yeah. And Forget these questions. I was able to write down a few, but then they took me through into emergency and they're like, you know, she's in ketoacidosis, we need to get a line in, all of those things. But I was so severely dehydrated mm. that they had 15 attempts at getting a line in and then decided to get an ultrasound machine to try and find my veins because I was so far down, couldn't come to the surface because of how dehydrated I was. And then they ended up having to have three or four goes to get an arterial line because they couldn't get any here. And, yeah, I think they had three yeah, three goes. I think it was 18 jabs I'd had. So I was just, like, covered in bruises and I ended up in ICU for a few days for that one. Yeah, wow. Which, yeah, that was really bad. And then another one that I'd had, which was my first ever ketoacidosis, was, oh, no. No, that was just, I think, something had happened with the line there too. I can't remember, but that was only a few days after getting the pump and my mum came up to stay with me for the night mm. and then the next day I was like I'll be fine you know off you go I promise I won't play netball and as soon as she left I went and played netball typical bag <laughs> I was just like I can do this um <laughs> but that was the night before my dad died so that was oh, wow. before he died that that had happened oh geez yeah all right well let's talk about that then yeah so where were you? Um, I was in Geelong and I was working a lot at that stage. Um, so I was doing uni for teaching. I was working in Torquay and also in town. Um, and, yeah, I think it was about midnight or so um, there was a knock at the door, which I was really confused because I knew that I was supposed to be starting early at it was Moby's in um Torquay mm, and I was just Mobis. I was really out of it I was like oh my god it must be Chris my boss like he must be coming to see where I am I must be late for work so I was quickly rushing around I'm like it's okay Chris I'm coming you know and I get to the door and it wasn't him and I was like oh my god it's dark outside and then I saw um my mum's best friend and her husband I was like hi what are you doing now she had been there the day before with my mum because she's also a nurse and she's like well if if Beck's not okay don't you come back down to Geelong I'll come around and check on her and I thought really weird time to show up to check on me but that's fine um and I said oh what have you guys been doing and they said oh we've just been out at a function but can we come in I was like yeah sure come in like you know do you want to drink are you okay and um yeah she just said She's like, Beck, there's, there's been an accident and you need to come with us. I was like, why? What, you know, what's happened? Who's called you? She said, your mum's called me. I was like, oh, okay, so, you know, what's happened then? And she said, well, your dad's been killed in a car accident. And I just was like, no, because dad's in Ballarat and, you know, he'd he would have been home by now. So, you know, if he isn't, he's probably there. So I kind of just dismissed it and she goes, no, you need to come with me. I was like, okay. But I think I just didn't have that. I don't know if I was, if you would say I was trying to be too rational or not rational because for me my first thought was like the next day I had an appointment in Geelong with all my pump stuff I was like, no no well I've got that appointment tomorrow so I'm going to need to be here do I have to come with you 
or how about I drive because I'm going to have to come back to Geelong tomorrow for this appointment. It's yeah. important. And yeah. she's like, no, you won't be driving. We'll organise someone to take you back. I was like, well, it doesn't matter. I'll just follow you. You know, to me, it was like, well, it makes sense that I drive because I've got a licence, I can drive, I've got a car, yeah. you know. You're just going into survival drive. mode. Your brain's not taking it in, is it? And it's like wants to carry life on as normal. Yeah. And yeah. then um, she was like, no, you need to we need to get your stuff together. We've got to go now. And unfortunately, my two housemates were away in Colac that weekend and not staying with me. I was the only one home. So I was like, oh, okay. So um, her husband was like, is there anything I can get you? Like, I'll get some stuff ready for you. Do you need anything? And I was like, oh, can you get my insulin and stuff out of the fridge then? And And I'll get my other things. And he was like, okay. But the poor thing, like he's a beautiful man, but obviously he didn't know what insulin was or what it looked like. And he was at the fridge and he was kind of like, mm. and I was like, I can, how about I get that and you get, I don't know, a blanket or something um, for the trip there. So I went and did that and a few things. And then I just remember like getting stuff together and I looked at her and I said, I don't think I've got any clothes for a funeral. And she was like, that's, that's okay, just get anything and we'll figure it out. And then that's where I was kind of like, oh, my God, I need clothes for a funeral. Like what am I coming back to here? So I think I didn't really break down or anything until I got back home. Like even on the way to Colac, my main thought was like, well, who's with mum? So I rang one of the girls that lived with me in Geelong because her dad was my dad's best mate. And I was like, well, I need to ring her and tell her because her dad will want to know. And I want someone to be there with mum. So I rang her and she always went to bed at nine o'clock. And she was like, you don't contact me after nine o'clock. I'm in bed. And she answered really quickly. And she just knew something was wrong because she's like, you wouldn't call me after nine o'clock. And I just, as soon as she answered, she goes, what's wrong? And I said, my dad's dead. And she was like, where are you? I said, um, someone's taking me back to Colac. And she goes, right, I'll go around now. And like seamless, she just knew what to do. I was like, you need to tell your dad. And she goes, I know, I'll see you in an hour. I was like, okay. And I just hung up and I was like, okay. And then I think I think I messaged one of my sister's friends because I knew my sister was out in Colac that weekend because she didn't live there. She lived in Melbourne at that stage. Um, but she had come down and I knew she was staying there. I don't know how I knew that. But, um, yeah, I messaged one of her friends and I was just like, are you with Hannah? And they said, yes, you know, are you okay? Where are you? And I I just didn't write back after that. I just wanted to know that someone was with her and then that someone was going to be with mum. So, yeah, we got to Colac. It's about an hour drive. And, like, my mum's friends just were so quiet. I think, you know, the poor things, what do you say? Um, But... Yeah, when we got to the driveway, we have a really long driveway. It was a three-acre property. And there was a taxi, like, blocking off our driveway. And one of my sister's friends was getting out of the taxi to go up. So she'd obviously found out or been out with her. And I just lost it. Like, I was so angry that they were blocking off our driveway. And I just got out and I was like, get out of the way, you know. It was just so cross like how dare you block my driveway and then I was cross because my sister's friend was you know they've been out drinking and doing whatever no fault of her own but I was like oh you know now I've got to look after you come up with me and I just started walking up the driveway instead of getting back in the car and so um yeah my mum's friends followed us up the driveway and you know I felt like I was consoling her 
at that time. But I think I was just really, you know, I just need to get to the front door and see where mum is. And, yeah, when I got to the front door, when it was opened, I did not recognise one person that was there. I was just like, who the hell are all of these people? Who were they? And it was actually one of my dad's cousins that that weekend they'd been down what, to see one of dad's brothers or something like that. They were all catching up. So when they'd been contacted that it happened, they all just came. Mm. I was like, who the hell is that? Like, I just got to the door. I was like, where is my mum? And then, you know, mum comes rushing out from one of the lounge rooms and, you know, that's when I kind of just broke down there because Hannah was there at that stage too, my sister. Mm. Um, but that was like the first time. But I think, I guess, I've always been cross about that situation that the that the people that were there first were not me and that when I opened the door I didn't see people that I knew and it made me cross because I'm like, well, why do you get to be here? Like who let you be here before I got here? Like I was kind of. There was just there was a lot of people. Like I'm saying, twenty plus people. Yeah. There when I got there, and I just kind of felt like I was the last to know, even though I wasn't. Yeah. So I don't know. I was just a cross person. You, like, you were just living quite far away, wasn't you? An hour's yeah. drive, and and yeah, and they would be grieving in their own way as well. But obviously, you're one of the closest people to your dad, so that's why you naturally felt like that. It's yeah. understandable. Um, and I think the people there too, like I didn't notice those few people when I first got there. But mm -hmm. then when I got in and after I'd kind of seen mum and walked out, like my friend who I'd who I'd rang, her and her mum were in there making cup of teas for everyone, were just like they had shit sorted. And that's what I will always remember and always be so thankful for mm -hmm. because like that's just what you do. You mm. jump in and you help how you can. Mm. Like her job wasn't to come to me at that time. Her job was to look after everyone else so they weren't coming in on us and just letting us have our family time before we decided to come out and be with others. Yeah. And I, like I've always been so glad that I rang her to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. So at what point did you get the information about how your dad died and how how that might have been that night? Um, we kind of have, it was kind of like different stories and information there. When we kind of got the full truth about what had happened it was at least a few days later. Like it was even on the news before we'd heard anything from like police anything like that wow so what was the new what was the news saying versus the truth that you found out days later well the news had, the news had said that it had happened on the highway which was correct um but we heard from other people that someone had come out of a driveway and gone out and then hit into dad or that dad was backing out and then got hit and i'm like well how does this shit even happen like how you know, Chinese whispers, I just hate that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, you and unless you have clear evidence to support what you're telling me, I'm not going to believe that, nor should you say something. There's evidence that not everything's always right when you hear it, right? Mm, yeah. <laughs> and I think too, you know, there was a lot of kind of, I don't know if you would put discrepancies, but... Things that happened in Dad's case that shouldn't have happened, like the person that first was assigned to my Dad's case, I won't say who it was, yeah. um, ended up being taken off the case because he didn't do the right things when he went to the accident site. What, like, what things did he not do? So when there is a traffic accident or any kind of accident there needs to be like a um 
I'm trying to think of the team name, but it's like a, I guess, a collisions team as such. And they come in and measure, like, if there's break marks. So they're measuring from the break mark to where the accidents happened and all of those different things. There's, like, specific people that come and do that, mm. um, like the road collisions or something team. And he didn't do that correctly, nor did he do the right testing of the person that hit dad, like as in drug testing, alcohol testing, blood testing, all of those things. That wasn't done. Not that it wasn't done. It wasn't done properly in the right, like the time frame that you're supposed to do it with him. But, but why? Why not? I don't know. Um, and then like even the interviewing of who was there to witness those things wasn't done properly and, like, I could go on. Mm. But So that man was taken off Dad's case and then we were given someone new to the case of which that man is just the saving grace of everything. Like I could not speak more highly of this policeman. I just think he is a ray of sunshine in my mind. Hmm. He put our family at ease and treated Dad like not just a victim, as a person. Like, How did he do that? I think the way he spoke about Dad, like he didn't say, um, well, he used his name all the time. Yeah. So referred to him as Philip or Phil. Yeah. Like he asked that. He's like, do you mind if I refer to him as Phil? And that's nice. He was just so great and he was so, he had so much time for us. Like, not that we were ringing him all the time, mm. but he gave us that option that if you need me night or day, you have my number. That's and nice. if you have any questions, you call me. He's like, and if I can't answer it, I'll get someone that can. He was just brilliant. So. Yeah, his name was Pat Cleary, and I just have so much respect for that man. Like, he brilliant. Hmm. And we're still in contact with him to this day. That's awesome. Like, the article that was in the paper of when I did the run and spoke about my dad, he um, got a copy of it and wrote to me about it and said how much he thought it was great, and he sent it to the TAC because he thought they should read it and... I don't know, he just, when I got married, he sent me a card and said congratulations. And when I had my first child, he was like, I'm so happy for you and your husband and, you know, it's great to see you happy and all of those things. I'm like, you don't have to do that. Yeah. No, he doesn't have to, but he wants to and that's the difference, yeah. isn't it? People... But I'm like, I, we're one family of, you know, hundreds if not thousands of people that he's helped. Like, is he still doing that for everyone? Because if he is, he is just... Yeah, an angel, right? Yeah. Oh, that's so, so good. I've got some pictures here. Uh, you can see behind me. I thought it was a good time to maybe show your relationship with your dad. Um, yeah. I put the big one there with you and your dad together. I've got another one. I've got another couple more, but there's you and your dad, Phil. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, did, I put one of yourself. Um, <laughs> I always tend to do that because, obviously, the other person I'm speaking to. Yeah. Um. My butt might fall over. That's happened before. Um, and I'm guessing this was Phil and you as a baby. There's the character coming straight through with the glasses on. You were young when you had this character. Indeed. That was very much channeling my Elton John or <laughs> Um Does your dad have particular hobbies? Because I've got one here that you sent me, which I appreciate it. Um, with it, it is, Like you mentioned earlier, actually, about the, the shooting. Yeah. So... Yes, loved his dogs and yeah. um, loved clay target shooting. Mm -hmm. um, but also he did a lot, you know, like hunting kind of duck shooting and things yeah. like that, which I know not everyone likes, but he did. Well, it was Australia back in the day, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, but like as a kid, he kind of grew up. His dad was, I don't know if his dad was a president of 
the club that he ended up being a president of, but he was very heavily involved in the club. And then when my pop died, they've still got like a memorial garden and everything for my pop there. Mm. Um, and then every year now they do what's called the Gaylard shoot, which is um, they usually did it for my pop, but then they combined it for dad and um, for pop. So every year they do that, which is really nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was heavily involved in the Colac film game. Um, and, yeah, when they used to do the licences or they used to have kids that were interested in, you know, like clay target shooting and stuff from different schools, you had to be a certain age, but they used to run it out at the Colac field and game where the police and dad and a few others would train the kids and show them how to, you know, be safe with guns, how to load it, how to shoot, how to, you know, techniques, all of those things. Yeah. Um, you know, my sister got her gun licence off my dad. He did all the testing and everything like that. So those things are really nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, so when Dad was actually killed, he was with a friend of his um, and they'd been chosen. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Masters Games, but the Masters Games is, I don't know if it's like a small Olympics. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, but like the teacher games here in Australia. Yeah. But, but yeah. for Masters, right? Older Big people. Metal, it's exciting. <laughs> um, yeah, so Dad was chosen in the Masters Games. Uh, with this other man as well um, in, like, a shooting team. They did really well. And then he got chosen, um, this man and dad, two people in Victoria to go and talk and teach people about ballistics training. So that's what they were actually coming back from when dad was killed. Mm. So the, there was another person in the car when dad was killed and he was injured very badly but luckily survived and he, we, you know, thank God he did and he was able to stay alert and be able to. Um, Make phone calls. No, he, what is it? When you called in to like view the person, I guess, he was no. able to do that and say, yes, this is this man. You can now contact his family. Yeah. Um, because after that he went downhill really quickly and, you know, was in surgery and stuff. So, um, again, still someone that we keep in really close contact with and he's a lovely, lovely man. I hope and, he's okay. Uh, oh, look, I think, like we said with grief, uh, you know, I'm sure for a long time he felt very guilty, you know, and, you know, it could, why wasn't it me and not Phil and all of those things, but you, yeah. you can't things like that because if it had happened to the other person then dad would be saying the same thing of course well, wasn't it me driving why couldn't it be me instead of him and now look at his family and all of those things but you just I think if you choose to think that like we've said before you're going to go into a deep dark rabbit hole and not going to be able to get yourself out and yeah I just think that is not an option. No, I agree. W w was it your dad who was driving? Yes. Yeah. And so what happened in that scenario, if you don't mind me asking, was it a, a pure accident? Was it an accident that could have been avoided? Was, did he just not see him coming? Was it head, like, what was the, the picture there? So <clears throat> they were on the highway, um, on the Midland Highway. and Which is a one laner on both sides, or is it two? One. One, one. on each side going in either direction. Yeah. So, um Dad was travelling 100 on the highway and then there is a road that kind of comes up over a dip but comes to meet the highway. And then on the other side there's like a dirt track. Um, so this person that hit Dad came up over the track at a very um, high speed and not slowing down right until the last minute when they were out. Um, onto the highway. Now, it was said in the case because it's, you know, been to court and trial and all those things now um, that he micro-slept. But, you know, I won't go into grave detail, but it he was being charged with driving and being negligent because he had worked for such a huge amount of time and not slept. 
mm. then went out and drove, um, of which is why they think he's micro-slept um, and done this. So, you know, it admittedly he is at fault, um, but nothing really came out of the court case other than, you know, getting a smack on the hand and, you know, good behaviour, but I'm told not to do it again, really. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.